So far for this lesson, we've talked about pages in the big picture and grids to help orient pages. We've talked about document design elements and how we can put contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity to work to organize pages. We're going to hone in now and spend a bit more time with just one document design consideration, text and typography. Some of you may already be font aficionados and people who pay close attention to the look and feel of text on a page. For those of us who don't pay much attention to typographic elements, I want to share just one example. In 2010, LeBron James left the Cleveland Cavaliers to join the Miami Heat. What you see on the screen is the letter that the majority owner of the Cavs, Dan Gilbert, wrote and publicly distributed the night LeBron announced his decision. Dear Cleveland, all of Northeast Ohio and Cleveland Cavaliers supporters, wherever you may be tonight, as you now know, our former hero who grew up in the very region that he deserted this evening is no longer a Cleveland Cavalier. This is rhetorically powerful language. It engages logos, ethos, and pathos. But you know what many people responded to almost immediately? Not the emotion or the passion underneath this letter. Probably the most public document Dan Gilbert has ever written. They responded to and commented on the fact that the letter was written in Comic Sans. Here are just a few of the hundreds of comments that flew across blogs and Twitter and Facebook after Gilbert posted the letter. Uh, on CNN, Dear computer users, if you're ever going to write a fuming letter, think twice before setting the font to the oh so mockable Comic Sans. On TechCrunch, yes, Gilbert wrote the entire letter in probably the worst font to ever grace the computer screen. Normally a staple among six-year-olds and grandmothers, Gilbert for some reason decided to use the font to write what will undoubtedly be the most public message he will ever write. Damn it. From Time Magazine Online, yes, that's right, the whole thing is written in Comic Sans, the favorite font of middle school breakup letters everywhere. On Ural Esque, yes, the sense of betrayal in Cleveland is real and probably pretty serious, but the power of Gilbert's words is lost in the ridiculousness of his font choice. And now, I want to give you guys a quick font quiz. Do you recognize this font face? Do you recognize this font face? Do you recognize this font face? And I would bet most of us have seen this several times already today. Um, as you look, start to hone in on the individual letters. The C, the O, do you recognize this font face? If you're a gamer, you do. Do you recognize this font face? Perhaps one of the most iconic typographic markers in our culture. Walt Disney. Do you recognize this font face? Do you recognize this font face? If you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you likely do. That was the font face used for um, Burger King. Burger King recently, however, rebranded, and they use now a mix of the new text treatment in their logo and their long-established font. Do you recognize this font face? How about this one? Do you recognize this font face? How about this one? At first glance, the typeface used for Snickers candy bars and the typeface used for the Fast and Furious franchise look fairly similar. Um, they're both bold, they're italicized, they give us a sense of movement and speed. But if we put them side by side, we see some really clear differences. The letter forms, for instance, are significantly different in shape. Focus on the capital D, the capital R. The thickness in the stems of the letters is significantly different. The letter forms are significantly different in height. And the punctuation style is completely different. So, as Speakerman and Ginger argued in one of this lesson's readings, type is everywhere. But let's step back. 
What is typography? Typography is a tool we can use to paint patterns of organization on a page, and type serves as the voice of the page. Stephen Heller, a graphic design scholar, argues that there are three considerations that govern type design. First, utility, or how a font functions. Second, aesthetics, or how it looks on a page or screen. And third, style, or what cultural code it evokes. I've posted some optional videos at the end of this lesson, and if you want to see a great story of a particular typeface, watch the Behind the Typeface video. If type is the voice of the page, what sort of voice do you hear here? Bit off balance, shouting, maybe loud, and here, perhaps youthful, a bit immature, material, we get a sense that this was crafted with a hand rather than a machine. And here, what sort of voice do we hear? What sort of voice do we hear? This is a key quote about text and type design that I absolutely love. Type visually represents words, of course. Text is how we convey meaning in writing. But text does more than that. It does the subtle work of sharing style and affecting a message. The three things that typography does are, first, it sets the mood and the look and the feel of a document. For instance, if we saw an entire resume set in Comic Sans or Curls MT, that design feature might throw off what we expect the document to do. Second, the design of text reveals the structure of the document to us. Think back to our last video on crap. One of the examples was the Starbucks booklet that used a consistent and very different looking design for its level one and level two headers. That text design helps to reveal the structure of the document. And third, typography offers clues about the type of the document. We should be able to quickly glance at a document and make some assumptions about what it is based on its typographic decisions and orientations. I'm going to show you a couple of documents really quickly. See if you can figure them out paying close attention to the text. a menu, a resume, and an essay. And we know that in part because of the textual characteristics of each. Here's another example where text and typography did significant work. This is an analysis by a graphic designer that appeared in the New York Times just before the 2003 election. The designer suggested that the all caps of Bush Cheney conveyed strength, integrity, and steadfastness. That the heavy text demonstrated confidence and boldness. The designer also suggested, however, that the Carrie Edwards font comes off as weak, friendly, and indecisive. Robin Williams, in the two short chapters we read for this lesson, distinguishes between readability and legibility. Readability has to do with whether or not an extended amount of text is easy to read, whereas legibility has to do with whether a short burst of text is recognizable and readable. I situated us by thinking broadly about the page, that the page might be print or digital, that the page might appear in a range of different contexts. This is a typical page from a traditionally formatted fiction book. We can see that the page uses a serif font and is set at full alignment. With a full size page of 8.5 by 11, full alignment would be really rough on the eyes. It would be harder to read because our eyes would see the page as a big block of undifferentiated text. But books aren't as wide as eight and a half, and their short page space allows for readable full alignment. Here's a sample page from a website, and we can see that a sans serif font is used, which research has shown us looks better on the screen and is easier on the eyes. The text is formatted in a relatively narrow column, left aligned. If you're not familiar with terms like serif or sans serif, no worries. We're going to talk about text vocabulary now. Here's a basic anatomy of text graphic. Cap height is the height of the capital letters for a particular typeface. X height is the height of the body of the letters. Ascenders are elements of letters that extend above the mean line of the X height. And descenders fall below the baseline of the X height. Some typefaces have serifs on them, or the little extra detail or tails on some of the letters. Descenders are important to pay close attention to when deploying type. Certain formatting features like underlining, which we hardly ever use anymore, can obscure the descenders. 
Letter case is important because of the work it does. Upper and lower case is much easier to read because our eyes can instantly recognize different letter forms where text in all caps appears as undifferentiated rectangles. Type size is also a crucial design consideration as it can help us assign importance to text and contrast text. And here's an example of quite a few of these variables in practice. The level one heading across this text is set in all caps, bold face, sans serif, at about a 14 point font size. The level two headings across the text are set in sentence case with just an initial capital letter, bold face, sans serif font, about 12 points in size. The body text is set in sentence case, Roman, and is sans serif and about 11 points. One of the most crucial things you'll have to be aware of as a document and media designer is that fonts are typically local. That means that the fonts on your computer aren't necessarily the same fonts on another person's computer. So if you design a document, use a bunch of different font faces, and send that document to someone else, if they don't have those fonts installed, they won't be able to see your document as you designed it. Here's an example. You might design a page like this using six different fonts. If you send me this page as a Word document, email attachment, and if I open it and don't have those fonts installed, my computer will default your design to system standard fonts and your design will look something like this. Pretty different. There's a short list of fonts that are called system standard or that you can be sure every computer, PC, or Apple has installed. There are quite a few places online where you can find lists of system standard fonts. These include serif fonts like Times New Roman and Palatino and sans serif fonts like Arial and Tahoma. And unfortunately, Comic Sans is one of the 20 or so system standard font faces. We'll also talk, as you guys work on Module 1, about another option, which is to convert your work or save your work to PDF or portable document format, which locks down the formatting features, including the fonts you've used. Now that we know a bit about how text works and have some text lingo down, we're going to talk about some ways of understanding and talking about text, specifically ways of distinguishing types of fonts. The first is the most common way. And you've seen examples of this already. There are two basic font families, serif and sans serif. Again, serif fonts have the little tails or nubs or extra detail. Sans serif fonts are, well, sans serif or without serif. They don't have the little tails. Another way to distinguish between fonts is to recognize them for their style or what they do and where they come from. Old style faces are meant to look like the type of text created with old fashioned metal letter presses and include fonts like Gaudi, Palatino, and Times New Roman. Condé Nast uses an old style. The New England Journal of Medicine uses an old style, which makes sense. The journal is one of the oldest, longest standing medical journals in the U.S. This traditional old style font helps establish its credibility. Tiffany & Co. uses an old style for its text treatment. Starbucks used an old style for the skinny latte campaign. Modern fonts don't necessarily mean modern as in 2014, but rather anchored to a modern moment in U.S. history. Typically the late 1800s into the early 1900s, characterized by mechanization, the explosion of consumer goods, the birth of advertising, and the movement of people to urban centers. Some contemporary businesses use modern fonts, like men's style, Diesel, and Tag Heuer. Slab serif fonts also emerged in the early 1900s when advertising was exploding and advertisers and typesetters wanted big, fat, attention grabbing fonts. Outcast uses a slab serif. So did the Beatles and Burger King. Script faces are meant to remediate the look and feel of handwriting. Brooks Brothers uses a script face as did the Jonas Brothers, and these similarities are not coincidental. Gap used a script face for their Pretty Khaki campaign. JLo used a script face for an earlier version of her website. Another category of fonts are decorative, which as their category name suggests, are primarily used for decoration. They're not particularly readable. Girl Shop uses a decorative font for its type treatment. A lot of video games use decorative fonts to establish a look and feel for different games. Novedades uses a decorative font. This isn't a technical term. <laughs> Some of my favorite fonts are in the crud font category. 
often also called eroded or decayed because they look eroded or decayed. The letters are meant to look broken off the baseline and deliberately sloppy and low resolution. Avril Lavigne used a crub font for an early version of her website. So did Toby Keith. GameSpot has used crud fonts on their site. Another category is iconic, meaning that the text is actually designed with icons embedded in the design of the font. So Frosty looks frosty with snowflakes. Flower Power has flowers, etc. And finally, there's the symbolic category, where the fonts are entirely made up of symbols rather than conventional letter and number forms. Uh, Wingdings is a symbolic font. I once met a sixth grade teacher who could read and translate Wingdings. Before wrapping up, I want to share one of my favorite videos of all time, a play on Lady Gaga's poker face designed to demo a new font. Let's break the lyrics down a bit. The singer says, I lay it out like they do in magazines, that is, creating page spreads. Using Adobe is not the same without a Mac, which reminds us that years ago, if you did graphic and document design, you had to use a Mac because only Mac supported the software. If it was lead, it would be lined up on a track. And here we see a photo of an old print setting shop actually manually laying out the individual metal letters to print a document. You'll read my, you can read my neutral face even if it's bold italic. 
A neutral face is one that's supposed to be empty of historical and cultural meaning. I would argue that's impossible, but designers strive for it. The key marker of an absolutely readable and legible font is that it's still clear and easy to read in bold and italic. And on the right here is the entire neutral face font family. The singer says he thought about Futura, but the M space was too wide. An M dash is made up of two hyphens and used to indicate a pause more significant than commas can set off. And it's very long for Futura. Gil Sands, he says, is whack in lowercase, and that's the lowercase g in Gil Sands, and it is rather whack. Avant-garde and Helvetica, he says, have both been played. By that, he means overused, and here's just a quick snapshot of some of the brands that use Helvetica in their text treatments. A few key parting thoughts. Remember that font faces are powerful. They create identity and associations. Using them well is key to creating legible, readable, clear messages. Remember, too, that font faces reflect cultural and historical messages and meanings. As document designers and media producers, we need to carefully select among font faces, attentive to the work they'll do in regard to audience, purpose, and context. We should also remember that fonts are limited in certain ways. There are only a handful of cross-platform, truly system standard fonts. What I would encourage you do, to do as you move into the activities for this lesson and the module for this week, and hopefully across this entire class and beyond, is to pay close attention to the typographic features of the documents you see. Learn to linger over letter forms.